Welcome back to Otaku Daikun! This video is the second part of my two-part lore video on Tsukihime. Thus, if you haven't seen my first video, do so now. Given how long the original visual novel was, I'm quite surprised that there is still so much world building to cover. Again, spoiler warning, as I'll be covering all of the rest of the franchise. Without further ado, let's kick things off with Kagetsu Toya. As it turns out, Kagetsu Toya is to Tsukihime what Fate Hollow Ataraxia is to Fate Stay Night. Almost exactly, in fact. In both games, you relive a set time period again and again, exploring all the options available to you for the sake of fan service and development that the original story couldn't accommodate. The experience is at first a mystery, but slowly over time you begin to understand the phenomena, make a decision, and break from the temporal loop. They expand upon the lore while simultaneously toying with canon and consequences so that we can have fun with otherwise dark and grim tales. Lore-wise, the best way to approach this is to break down the mystery of exactly what's happening in the story. At the heart of Kaget's Toya is a very minor character in Tsukihime, one so insignificant I didn't bother mentioning it in part one. This character is a cat familiar named Len. While she never made a direct appearance in Tsukihime, she was part of the plot of Arcoade's route. After Shiki defeats Nero Chaos, Arcoade decides to thank him by requesting the help of a cute little demon cat who sneaks into the Tono Mansion and gives Shiki an erotic dream. This cat, Len, is a succubus able to manipulate dreams. She gets upgraded from a mere footnote to being the central heroine in Kagetsu Toya. Now's a great time to specify exactly what a familiar is within the Nasuverse. Thankfully, it's not that complex. Basically, mages are able to infuse their mana into different creatures, such as golems or dead animals, to serve as assistants. You'll often see them used for reconnaissance, but they can also attack, like Medea's dragon fang warriors. Other times, it's beneficial to have a familiar that's intelligent and conscious. Well, it requires a lot of mana to command something as complex as a human, so mages get around this by infusing a newly dead human's essence into the body of a dead animal. This is just shy of actually resurrecting the dead. Rather, it's more akin to reanimation. Len was created in such a way, combining a dead girl's essence with the corpse of a cat. She was created by a magus, but never had much opportunity to serve. This magus's name isn't stated, but he apparently helped Arcoade defeat a dead apostle ancestor, number seven, Einash before retiring to a humble country home beyond a vast field of sunflowers. He spent his remaining days alive sitting on his patio, accompanied by Len. One day, after years of waiting upon him in silence, the old man dies and Len loses her master. In exchange for the help fighting, Arcoade looks after Len for the Magus, but cannot serve as her master since she's not human. Similar to a heroic spirit, without a master, a familiar cannot maintain its form for long without a steady mana supply. Thus, Len is in danger. While she's bound to disappear eventually, Len can hang around longer by absorbing mana from those she provides dreams for. At the beginning of Kagetsu Toya, Shiki is walking down the street and notices a dump truck breaking to avoid killing Len in cat form in the middle of the road. Without hesitation, Shiki rushes in, grabs the cat, and dodges the speeding truck until splitting his head open on the sidewalk curb. Needless to say, Shiki is heavily injured and is taken to the hospital for stitches. Arcoade witnesses the accident and asks Len to help him. The cute Kuroneko places Shiki's mind into a special dream in which he relives the same day again and again. This is to help Shiki survive the car wreck, keeping his mind occupied while his body gradually heals in the hospital. However, while the dream appears to be all for Shiki's sake, it's subconsciously an opportunity for Len to experience, vicariously, a pleasant life she never had any chance to be a part of. The vast majority of Kagetsu Toya is fan service that helps develop the world, but does so with a light tone. For instance, the dream Shiki continues to live forms around him as he imagines it. If he thinks it's time for the school festival, then it is. If it's a day off, it is. This allows him to pretty much do anything except for escape from the dream or realize what's going on. He naps with Arcoade, takes Ciel out for curry, gets tortured by Kohaku, gropes Hisui, and even sees Akiha dressed as a Nekomata for a haunted house. 
Fan service aside, it does develop a few things. There's a neat moment where Shiki gets a visit from his doctor Sogen's daughter, Tokie. I'm convinced Nasu's insane or a supreme troll, but he actually stated that Tokie was Shiki's first sexual partner. I wonder when that went down. There's a bizarre scene in which Len gives a paralyzed Shiki a foot job. I can only assume she does this to keep his sexual urges in check during the continual dreaming. Over time, as Len loses more and more mana, she begins to lose control of the dream world. This is first pointed out distinctly when Shiki notices it snowing out of season and spots Len running to go and correct the error. Dream CL winds up confronting her previous possessed self, a manifestation of her greatest fear and regret. Shiki himself winds up facing off against an evil doppelganger of his own, a version of himself completely controlled by his Nanaya instincts. Even worse, Shiki's vision of death manifests in the form of the man who murdered his village as a child, Koma Kishima. Before long, Shiki starts coming to his senses, even realizing that his body in the real world has recovered and it's okay for him to wake up. He challenges Koma Kishima and defeats him upon realizing he's not the real guy, but rather a vision. With things all wrapped up, Shiki makes a contract with Len, making her his familiar. Oh, and of course, they bang to seal the deal. Damn, semen is like a multi-purpose miracle substance in the Nasuverse. I like it. Anyway, Shiki wakes up from the dream, Kitty is okay, and everyone is glad to see that Shiki pulled through. That's the main plot of Kagetsu Toya. But as you complete this route, you actually unlock other side stories along the way. Among these side stories are some throwaways. One that chronicles Shiki's father, Kiri Nanaya, up to and including the attack on his village. Another where Ciel is a teacher at Shiki's school. And a few parodies. Not to say these stories are bad, they just don't add enough for me to mention. One of the more interesting and obscure side stories in Kagetsu Toya is one involving Ciel's badass weapon, the Seventh Holy Scripture. Basically, while she uses the weapon to hunt vampires, it was originally created by the church by killing a unicorn and fusing its horn with the soul of a recently killed girl. That's bizarre, isn't it? Well, over a long time, the girl's soul and the unicorn horn formed into a nature spirit, or elemental, that resides within the finished weapon. After Ciel modifying the weapon and using it to its greatest potential, the elemental spirit was able to take form. Of course, this consciousness hates being modded by Ciel and manages to escape for a time. The point of this side story is that Arihiko, Shiki's best friend, winds up injuring himself on the scripture, which he finds in the river and takes back home. His blood got on the weapon and allowed him to see the elemental in her physical form a cute blonde girl with hooves and a tail. Of course, she loves carrots and is eating all of his food. As far as Arihiko is concerned, this horse girl is haunting him. She says her name is Seven, Nana in Japanese, so he turns it into an actual name, Nanako. Everything is made clear by the end when Ciel arrives discreetly to retrieve the Seventh Holy Scripture. It effectively accomplishes nothing by introducing a character we never see again. Nonetheless, it's fascinating. Kagetsu Toya's side stories also offer up continuations, follow-ups to some of the endings in Tsukihime. There's one that continues Akiha's true ending, where she eagerly awaits the day she can see Shiki again. Shit goes down at her school, but in the end, she discovers Ciel has somehow saved Shiki despite the sacrifice he made. In retribution, Akiha intends to make Shiki wait longingly for her this time. Why are anime characters usually so damn awkward with romance? Another side story chronicles Roa's first encounter with Arcoid, still in her form as Archetype Earth. Now, about that. When Arcoid was created, before Altruge stole her hair, her personality and powers were directly linked to the Crimson Moon. I mentioned before that the Earth itself has no ultimate one. So I guess Archetype Earth, this personality of hers, is the closest thing to one. Hell, if she wants, she can destroy the entire planet which she tries to do in her Melty Blood arcade route. Basically, kinda like Ryogi Shiki has a personality directly connected to the root, now conveniently named Void Shiki, Arcoid has a personality directly connected to the Crimson Moon. The two are some of the most powerful entities in the Nasuverse, but we'll argue semantics another time. The last of these side stories that I find worth mentioning is one in which Shiki gets drunk one evening during the Lantern Festival, a time when people honor and connect with the dead. 
and speaks with his adoptive brother, no longer consumed with his inversion or Roa's possession. It's very sweet, reaffirming their friendship, imparting on solid terms, considering the tragedy they both endured. Then there's Melty Blood, a short series of fighting games with visual novel elements that presents its own story. Now, originally, Tsukihime's first visual novel was supposed to include another plot route centered around Satsuki Yumizuka, the classmate who gets turned into a vampire, and Shiki has no choice but to put out of her misery. I could be wrong, but I think this is also the missing plot route people are looking forward to seeing in the eternally teased Tsukihime remake. Anyway, Melty Blood is apparently a sequel to that plot route, and not the others. Gotta give credit to Type Moon for making a sequel to a non-existent plot route. Regardless, Melty Blood by context gives us an idea of what the route might have looked like. In it, Shiki defeats both Nero Chaos and Roa like an Arcoade's route, but none of the girls die, and Arcoade doesn't go back to her castle. Shiki apparently has a major run-in with Satsuki, and, given some dialogue, was unable to save her. All things considered, it's a very neutral route to build a sequel upon. Now, the events in the first Melty Blood game are all over the place with different plot routes, but they all lead up to a definitive route that I want to focus on. To do that, we've got to talk about Sion and the Atlas organization. The Mages Association has a branch located in Egypt called Atlas. This is where alchemists are trained and gathered. One of the talents of alchemists is the ability to enhance the mind so that it's capable of running simultaneous trains of thought all at once making them highly skilled in calculations. Within Atlas was a genius alchemist by the name of Zepia Eltnum Oberon. During this time, the Eltnum family was quite prestigious, and his skill in alchemy helped him calculate and predict the future. He looked far ahead and calculated that the world in its entirety would be destroyed by a universal law known as Program Number Six. He wanted to oppose this law and felt that the only way to do this was to become a vampire with superior powers. He disgraced the Eltham name by breaking its golden rule, that Atlas research never be divulged to outsiders. He became a dead apostle and consulted Arcoade's sister, Altruge, to gain power. She summoned the Crimson Moon and transformed Zepia into a curse, Tatari, that technically lacks a mortal form and instead manifests in the form of words, rumors, and ideas via a reality marble. The first time he manifested as Tatari, it was the rumored vampire of Wallachia, thought mistakenly to be Vlad the Impaler. Thus, he became known as the Knight of Wallachia. He is meant to exist in this form for 1,000 years until the Crimson Moon shows up again, returning him to mortality. This seems weird, and rightfully so. Essentially, no matter how hard or often he searched, he couldn't find a way to prevent humanity's impending destruction. He thought that the only way out would be to take a completely unpredictable path toward the future. Funny enough, he actually made himself go so batshit insane that even he couldn't predict his own next moves. The result is a madman who takes the form of others, manifesting at different points in time to kill people. Yippee! Prior to Melty Blood, Sion Eltnum Sokaris, a descendant of Zepia, joins the Atlas organization and, despite her family's tainted reputation, winds up in a high-ranking position, enough to have her name changed to Sion Eltnum Atlassia. Turns out, the Knight of Wallachia appeared in an Italian village, and the church asked Atlas for help because of their connection. Atlas organized a team of alchemists to join the hunt for Tatari, and Sion joined alongside Riesbeif Striedberg, a shield knight of the church. Ultimately, they failed, as Tatari wiped out the village and most of the hunters. Riesbeif sacrificed herself so that Sion could escape, but even then, Sion only managed to escape after having been bitten. Sion never returns to the Mage's Association, and she's pursued by the church for having been tainted by a vampire. Sion finds her way to Misaki Town and meets Satsuki, who had also been bitten by a vampire. The two form the Back Alley Alliance, looking for a way to cure vampiric impulses. As a team, they learn about Shiki's battles against Nero and Roa. For a while longer, Sion continues to resist her vampiric urges, and Melty Blood begins when she confronts Shiki in search of Arcoade. The two fight, and during the battle, Sion uses a whip-like tool called the Aetherlight to not only attack, but also siphon his thoughts and memories. 
by the end, she has a hold on Shiki, whereby she can manipulate his nervous system to incentivize his obedience. Either way, Shiki decides on his own to join Sion in her search to cure vampiric urges. The Knight of Wallachia manifests in town, taking the form of both Arcoid and Nero as opponents, before finally urging Sion into her vampirism. Shiki helps in defeating all these foes, but cannot kill Tatari, as he has no actual body. That is, until Arcoid shows up and uses her marble phantasm to distort time such that the Crimson Moon arrives once more. This returns Zepia to a plain old dead apostle that Shiki defeats. With this, all is presumed well. Before continuing, I want to point out the hellish joke route in the first Melty Blood, in which Tatari possesses Kohaku into attacking the Tono Mansion and its residents. She goes through the trouble of making a mechanized Hisui, and even transforms Akiha into a giant to cause mischief, but is ultimately defeated by the youngest daughter of the Aryuma family Shiki used to live with. This girl, Miyako, makes her first official appearance in Melty Blood as a Bajikwan martial artist who learned her techniques from Master Panda, a mysterious person wearing a panda costume. I did say this was a joke route, didn't I? Miyako's your last opponent in the route, and she has almost nothing to do with the story. But I guess she's popular enough to have her own spin-off work, Hana no Miyako. That's the first game, but later titles add even more details to the lore. These are Melty Blood's React, Act Cadenza, and Actress Again. All of these play with alternate timelines and what-if scenarios, mainly revolving around another incarnation of Tatari, which manifests next into White Len, a new form of life created by Aoko Aozaki from Wallachia's remains. She's got the powers of both Len and Tatari, which makes her into a boss in React. In short, the infamous Aoko Aozaki hears about Wallachia's defeat and uses his remains to create herself a familiar and winds up causing the conflict for the entire game. She's quite the troublemaker. Let's jump ahead to Melty Blood Actress again, which I've had the luxury of streaming for you all. Everything that occurs within this game is due to the scheming of the final boss, the Dust of Osiris. To keep things simple, the way I like them, the Dust of Osiris is an alternate version of Sion created through the blood Wallachia stole from her. Her form is that which could have been a Sion that decided to stay with Atlas and develop her alchemy to its peak. She creates the Philosopher's Stone as a means of curing her vampirism. And while she's at it, she resurrects Riesbife to serve as her bodyguard. She succeeds Wallachia as the new Tatari, granting her the title of 13 of the 27 dead apostle ancestors. She's extremely powerful and extremely cheap, but what's her goal in all of this? Well, I mentioned before that Wallachia aka Zepia, calculated the future and predicted the end of humanity. His response to that was to go crazy and become unpredictable. Not the best method, clearly. The Dust of Osiris, however, has a goal similar to Sora and Araya from Kata no Kyokai, and that she thinks the best or only salvation for humanity is to end it herself and keep an eternal record of human history. Basically, she can't save humanity, but she can preserve it. Thus, she shows up a year after the first Melty Blood, and recreates the whole fighting spiel with some liberties, forming what's called the Hologram Summer. She does this to get back to the moment in the first game when Arcoid called forth the future to help defeat Wallachia. In this moment, she could ascend as an even stronger Tatari to fulfill her plan to encapsulate the record of humanity. I swear, these high and mighty final boss types are all a huge pain in the ass. Anyway, pick a character, and most of them will face Osiris as part of their story. She's defeated, the illusion fades, and it seems like Tatari is gone for good. I sure hope it is. On the plus side, Riesbife is alive again, and joins the Back Alley Alliance, just in time to make cringy comedy for Carnival Phantasm. Kaget's Toya and Melty Blood are two very different kinds of sequels to the original Tsukihime, but there is actually another version for the story that has the potential to become Tsukihime too. This is shown in the Tsukihime manga, which follows up on Arcoid's true ending. Shiki, not fearing Arcoid's vampiric impulse, decides to break into the castle Brunstead and free Arcoid from her chains so they can live happily together. To me, it's a nice fairy tale sort of ending, and I can't help but like it. A further continuation comes in the form of a book called Tsukihime Plus Period, released with all sorts of goodies, including two short stories named Talk and Prelude. 
Honestly, I can't speak of them as in-depth as I'd like to, as details are vague and they aren't that popular. But they describe that Shiki continues on living in the form of a dead apostle ancestor called Satsujinki. If I had to guess, I'd say he willingly allows Arcoade to drink his blood so the two can continue being together. He's Arcoade's right-hand man, but decides to venture to Germany in search of the fruit of Einash, which could help quell Arcoade's bloodlust. Recall that Einash is a dead apostle ancestor that Arcoade killed with the help of Len's master. Well, his dying body was left atop a blood-sucking tree, turning the whole damn forest into a phantasmal creature. Anyway, Shiki, aka Satsujinki, confronts and defeats Forte of the Mages Association without killing her, and winds up being guided through the forest by the voice of Marim Solomon, a dead apostle ancestor who's also a member of the burial agency. His body is with Ciel, and the two venture into the forest as part of their own unit. In the end, Shiki kills the forest after it goes berserk. In Prelude, Shiki infiltrates the castle of another dead apostle ancestor, Louvre, in order to steal a mace. In the process, he ends up killing Louvre and his children, screwing over Bartholomew Lorelei, vice director of the Mages Association, who wanted credit for killing them. These exploits could very well become part of or serve as an inspiration for a Tsukihime sequel. Will this ever happen? I personally wouldn't hold my breath. However, it would be freaking awesome to see the story, which originally sticks glued to Misaki Town, branch out and become more adventurous. It's always nice to see more agents of the Mages Association, as well as fleshing out the other 27 dead apostle ancestors. They're a lot like true magics in the sense that Nasu has reserved so many of them, but hasn't actually written them all into cohesive stories. Anyway, before there was Fate Stay Night giving you a supreme mindfuck with all its spin-off universes and alternate timelines, Tsukihime was hard at work making sure even the most studious fans are left baffled by all the jokes and alternate story branches. As far as I'm concerned, play Tsukihime and pick your favorite route, or read the manga which is fantastic. Check out Kagetsu Toya for some fun, optional antics, and play Melty Blood if you're still immersed in the lore and want to actually play as any of the characters. Lastly, look forward to the future, where Tsukihime gets more development, or perhaps gets merged into Fate Grand Order, like many of the other Type Moon works. As someone who originally put down the original visual novel because it looked old and irrelevant, I am gratefully surprised by how emotionally and narratively rich the series is. While I still prefer Kana no Kyokai and Fate, this has been a fantastic treat that I definitely recommend to any Type Moon fan. Thank you so much for sticking with me through the entire franchise. If you enjoyed this video, then please consider supporting us on Patreon. Take advantage of one of our many reward tiers, ranging from early access to the chance to request a video of your very own. Also, don't forget to share this video and subscribe to Otaku Daikun for more anime lists, reviews, discussions, lore videos, let's plays, and the holy waifu wars. Until next time, celebrate your fandom.